Good morning, everyone. Good morning, at least in this part of the of the world. Uh, and welcome to the side event Building Roof and Raising Floors. I'm Magdalena Sepulveda. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Initiative for Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and the former UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. I'm pleased to be moderating this very important discussion on social protection floors today. I would like to start by thanking the participants and the, the speakers and the sponsors of this event. We appreciate their support, their involvement, and um, we are going to introduce the speakers as they speak. And you can also review their bios in, uh, they are going to be posted in the chat functions. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, our attendees. Uh, we have now uh, more than 70 attendees and the numbers will be increasing uh, slowly as we can see. In this Zoom webinar, we cannot uh, see the faces of those who are attending the meeting, but we will invite everyone to introduce yourself in the chat bar function and post your question in the question and answer uh, uh, function in the bottom of your screen. Also, if you need translation, uh, there is translation to French and Spanish, and you can also uh, connect to your translation in the bottom of the uh, screen of your Zoom. Uh, our conversation today will cover many in very important topics related to social protection floors uh, and the importance of very critical issues such as uh, uh, digital inclusion, uh, funding, and the importance of social protection floor in particular in the light of uh, several pandemic from COVID pandemic to the environmental crisis. Um, I will remind everyone again to uh, participate through the chat bar and the question and answer. And we are going to start with the first section of this panel, in which we're going to have an overview from uh, member states and the special rapporteur. The first speaker this morning is Madame Kitir, Minister of Development Cooperation in charge of major cities in the government of Belgium. Madame Kitir, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Thank you. Dear friends, uh, it is an honor to be here with you today. So thank you for inviting me to share a few words with you. As you know, this event is part of a series of side events parallel of the official proceedings of the United Nations Commission for Social Development. Social Development. Let us reflect a few seconds on those two words. Those two words evoke positivism and optimism. Those two words evoke progress. But today there is a reality that challenges all of this. And that reality is named COVID. COVID indeed undid the progress of the last decade. 100 million people or even many more are being pushed back into extreme poverty. Due to COVID worldwide, we do not progress on social development. No, it is the complete opposite. We are facing social regression. And the reason for this regression goes beyond the pandemic. In Belgium, we have all been able to appreciate the importance of our social protection system. Allowing access to quality health care and guarantee income and therefore food and housing for families, even in the most difficult times. But for too many, there is no social, no such social protection. Actually, a social safety net is lacking for most people on the planet. So social safety nets not only provide short term solution in case of, of crisis but they also break the never ending cycles of poverty and vulnerability, they empower people. And therefore, as Belgian Minister of Development and Cooperation, I launched a first initiative, a new thematic program in Central Africa, 
in order to strengthen social protection mechanism. And of course, this Belgian initiative is just a drop in the ocean. But dear all, for social protection, every drop counts. However, we need to go much further. Low income countries need $78 billion to close the financing gap for the social protection system. We cannot solve this by ourselves, but let us do our part. My compatriot, Professor De Schutter, the United Nations Special Reporter on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, with whom who I am honored to share this tribune, has been studying and advocating a global fund for social protection. Well, such a global fund is, I believe, exactly the sort of answers that the world needs to draw the lesson, lessons from the COVID crisis. And those lessons are affordable universal health care, proper housing, education for children, a guaranteed income in case of crisis like, like this pandemic. All these things should not be privileged, luxurious, no, no, these are rights. They are basic human rights. And the virus, the virus knows no borders. And so in response, our solidarity should no, not be confined by borders. My first masterclass in solidarity was my first job more than 20 years ago, on a factory floor assembling cars, on the floor as a trade union representative in order to defend, to, to defend my colleagues and their rights. And today we could say my task is to protect social rights worldwide. And I know that might sound quite ambitious, even more a reason to do this together. A global fund for social protection, properly funded and managed might be the tool we need because we are all in this together. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. And thank you for that uh, very passionate call for the Social Fund on Social Protection. Now, um, I will give the floor to uh, Madame Saila Ruth, State Secretary to the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health of the Government of Finland. Uh, Madame Ruth, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for the organizers of this discussion and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today with you. I was asked to share some experiences about fighting homelessness in Finland with you and I'm very happy to, to do so. So first of all, I, um, I have to stress that ending homelessness must be seen in a wider context of uh, social security, universal social and health services and production of affordable housing. Since the mid uh, 1980s, tackling homelessness has almost continuously been a focus of uh, government programs in Finland. And now the goal of this pro um, government is to cut homelessness in half by 2023 and eradicating it totally by 2027. We are continuing the strategy called Housing First, which has proven proved to be very effective. Traditionally, housing has been seen as the final goal of social recovery. Housing first principle shifts this paradigm. The idea is simple, to give people permanent housing and support they need as soon as they become homeless. When a person has a roof securely over their head, it is easier to focus on solving other problems, such as joblessness, mental illness, alcohol or drug problems, etc. But of course, we also need to prevent people from becoming homeless. Affordable housing is one key element, and together with that, we need to provide different sorts of social and employment services, as well as financial and housing guidance. That way, we can in early stage support people who would otherwise be in the risk of homelessness. Also, social security is important in preventing homelessness. Social benefits, both risk-based and universal, 
play an important role in helping people to access proper housing in times when they don't have sufficient resources themselves. The most important lesson is that homelessness is not inevitable. It can be ended. It is a realistic goal. It is ethically and morally right, and it is economically justified. As uh, Madame Gitir just said, housing is a human right, and therefore it is the government's duty to act to secure it. Of course, ending homelessness is not easy. It requires a wide partnership. All relevant actors must work together. It also requires innovativeness, which is the same as in digital and technological inclusion, which we will hear about more later on. Furthermore, ending homelessness requires the very basic attitude of building the society and its structures on trust and inclusiveness. This means that all the actions taken has to be viewed from the perspective of different people. For example, majority of homeless people in Finland are men, so most of the users of different services uh, aimed for homeless people are men. But if we ignore the different patterns and mechanisms of, of homelessness of women, we might not be able to reach homeless women and help them. And this is why the agents of change, the developers and different uh, actors of the, of the services, uh, they must be diverse set of people people of different backgrounds and positions. And this is again a thing that applies also to the inclusiveness of technology and digitalization. Putting people at the center and leaving no one behind are ways of saying that in a welfare state, there are no we and them. There are, and there has to be only equal people with the same rights because they are people. But even more than the points that I just made, ending homelessness requires a systematic change. If temporary accommodation, a place in a shelter, is the main option for homeless people, it will not lead to ending homelessness. And to conclude, I uh, just want to say that in the light of the COVID-19, it is very timely to reintroduce proposals such as the Global Social Protection Fund in order to meet the global challenges in the field of social protection. We have a duty to ourselves and to the future generations. We must ensure that social dimension is fully integrated in the implementation of Agenda 2030 at all levels, and we need all the tools we can come up with in order to succeed. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we are not short on ambition, so it's it's very important. We, we heard uh, the government of uh, the representative of the government of Belgium about important program in Central Africa. And now we heard from the representative of the government of Finland about eradication of homelessness in 2027. And both of them very passionate about the social protection fund. So with this, I'm going to give the floor now uh, to my dear friend, the special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights. Olivier, you have the floor. Well, many thanks indeed, uh, Magdalena, and very warm welcome to all the participants in this important event. Um, this is a very unique moment. Um, and on the Global Fund for Social Protection, I think we have now pledges, figures, and an opportunity we cannot afford to miss. We have a number of pledges already, some of which have been referred to by our esteemed Minister Miriam Kitir. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals call for an increase in international solidarity in support of target number, or goal number one of the SDGs, which is to eradicate poverty, calling on all countries to ensure that we, ensure that we have a significant mobilization of resources from a variety of sources, including through enhanced development cooperation, in order to provide adequate and predictable means for developing countries. This was also referred to in the Social Protection Floor's recommendation number 202, adopted in 2012, 
within the international labor organization. And as we all recall, the final report of the Social Protection Floor Advisory Group chaired by Ms. Michelle Bachelet um, in 2011 referred to the need for donors to provide, and I quote, predictable multi-year financial support for the strengthening of nationally defined and determined social protection floors in low income countries within their own budgetary frameworks and respecting their ownership. So we have pledges. We have also figures. We know today that it is affordable for OECD countries to provide that minimum support that low income countries need in order to finance social protection floors. The financing gap, as recalled by Minister Kitir, has been estimated to be at 78 billion US dollars. This is affordable. This is about half the total official development assistance provided in 2019 by OECD countries. And thirdly, we have an opportunity. This crisis reminds us all of the urgent need to build social resilience in order to better prepare countries to future shocks, whether these are economic, climatic, or indeed pandemic. However, although we have this emerging consensus, these figures, this support and this opportunity, we still have a few misunderstandings about what the Global Fund for Social Protection could achieve and why it is necessary. And let me make in this respect three remarks. First, the idea of the Global Fund for Social Protection, which Magdalena Sepulveda, a special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights and myself had been also discussing in 2012, but which was proposed uh, by others at the same period, that Global Fund does not mean that rich countries' taxpayers pay for social protection in low-income countries. What it means is that OECD countries, rich countries, would provide temporary support to strengthen the ability for low-income countries to mobilize domestic resources in order gradually for those domestic resources to take over and to make international support less necessary. Indeed, such a funding would be an incentive for low-income countries to invest in social protection not any social protection, but social protection which is rights-based, creating legal entitlements that people may claim in the spirit of Recommendation 202 on social protection flaws that I've mentioned, requiring predictability in financing. And this incentive that low-income countries should have would stimulate them to invest in social protection and thus to prepare long-term growth and prosperity by investments in human capital and by encouraging parents to invest in their children, young workers to invest in training and entrepreneurs to invest in innovation. Secondly, the Global Fund for Social Protection does not mean that low-income countries will, receiving, will be receiving support only in the form of finance. Instead, the Global Fund for Social Protection should also be a strong incentive for rich countries to remove obstacles to the mobilization of domestic resources by low-income countries and providing support to those countries to achieve such mobilization. We know that there's a strong lack of capacity amongst national administrations in many countries, tax authorities, labor inspectorates in particular. We also know that tax avoidance and tax evasion are a major obstacle that developing countries face in order to mobilize resources for social protection. The Global Alliance for Tax Justice has estimated that corporate tax abuse alone, combining tax avoidance by base erosion and profit shifting practices from companies and tax evasion, corporate tax abuse represents a loss of 245 billion US dollars per year. Private tax evasion represents a loss of 182 billion US dollars per year. And those are only the direct losses. If you add to this the indirect losses from tax competition uh, across countries in the absence of coordination and harmonization, the total losses are around 900, perhaps $950 billion per year. Um, and thirdly, many countries have still a very important part of the workforce that is informal. And so the formalization of workforce is indispensable 
for those countries to be able to graduate to allow um, them to, to mobilize domestic resources for investment in social protection. In all these areas, capacity building, formalization of work, the fight against tax evasion and tax avoidance, we can help by strengthened international cooperation. Thirdly and finally, the Global Fund for Social Protection does not mean that beneficiary low-income countries are given a blank check. Those who defend the idea of a Global Fund for Social Protection understand that this should go hand in hand with a national process by which the needs to close the financing gaps and the, and the social protection gaps in the beneficiary countries should be launched in order to make progress towards establishing social protection flaws. And the ILO since 2016 has been pioneering the idea of assessment-based national dialogues now developed over more than 26 countries across the world and involving social partners, civil society organizations to build a strong, le legitimate um, um, national ownership um, in a process of identifying gaps in social protection and identifying solutions by which such social protection can be established for the benefit of the population. And so I, I have many hopes that the Global Fund for Social Protection that is now on the agenda of the G20 and of other international fora um, shall build more and more support across countries, unions and civil society groups in order for this to be the positive development from the crisis through which um, we, we are going. I would like to, to thank you for the opportunity to address uh, this, um, this panel and I look forward to our, to our discussions. Many thanks indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Olivier. Uh, and, and as you said, this is a critical moment to push forward for the Global Fund for Social Protection, which will be the kickstart to help developing countries to mobilize domestic resources. In this second session section of the uh, panel today, we're going to go now for uh, those who are going to share with us life experience uh, on social protection and the need for social protection for all. I will remind all the, uh, those participants that you can find the full bios of all the uh, panelists in the chat uh, box. And now I have uh, the pleasure to introduce an old friend, uh, Rob Robinson from Partners for Dignity and Human Rights and the Institute of Global Homelessness. Rob, you have the floor. Magdalena, thank you very much. And it is an honor for me to be in this forum and to follow the three speakers that opened up this discussion because you have given me tools to sort of challenge my government, the wealthiest country in the world. So my name is Rob Robinson. I am formerly homeless. I have a lived experience. I spent two and a half years on the streets of Miami homeless and 10 months in a New York City homeless shelter. And as a direct response to the Minister of Finland, I really appreciated uh, your thoughts on shelter, right? It is not the answer. And if we allow my city, New York, to continue the way it is, we have 550 of them. So the thinking is the way to end it is to just hide it. And that's not the way you get at the problem. Housing first is the way. I'm a big promoter of that. But I want to speak more so on data and the digital divide that exists and uh, the lack of people, people's ability to uh, organize around homeless issues. So. We, we, we are blessed in this city to be the financial capital of the world, yet there is a divide that exists. And when I first met Magdalena, it was at Columbia University in 2011, and I had the opportunity to chat with her one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm, I'm sure Magdalena experienced street homelessness in New York City. On a given night, there were 65,000 people in shelter and probably that many sleeping in public spaces. And how do you, when you have something like COVID-19 come along, how do you organize to give people access to report issues, especially when our federal government 
issues a mandate from the Center for Disease Control that says shelter in place. Well, if I'm street homeless, how do I do that? But also how do we report those people that are living in informal settlements across the US? The only way we've been able to do it, and it's not with much help of our government, so we're using this forum to try to make our voices heard, is to organize students and community-based NGOs to come together. And students with mapping skills have been able to map and show us where those gaps are and develop an app that we're able to give to street people and to report issues. And street people do have access to some technology. Our government under the Obama administration had made cell phones available to anybody who was receiving a government subsidy. However, there are flaws in that process also. If you're living in a shelter, they only allow one phone per address. So if you have a shelter with 60 people, 59 of them living in that space can't have one of those cell phones unless they had acquired it elsewhere before going into shelter. So there are problems with that, but we've been able to organize and mobilize students, other community members to come together to try to figure out people-centered solutions because our government doesn't seem to have the answers. So I'm, I'm really honored to be able to have the information from the Minister of Finland and the Minister of, of, of Belgium and their messages, this recording would be a very powerful tool for me to deliver to human rights advocates across the country to sort of mobilize our country and think about how do we make the digital, how do we lessen the digital divide to, to lessen that gap, to, uh, to close those spaces and allow people to have access to technology because communication is a human right. So I, I'm honored to participate in this forum. Um, I'm honored to be in front of current and former rapporteurs. And, you know, as Philip Alston, the rapporteur in extreme poverty recently reported with a report from the Global South in the US, we have some serious problems in this country that existed for long periods of time, but were exacerbated by COVID-19. Thank you for the opportunity. And I look forward to working with all of you in the future. Thank you very much, Robbins. Thank you for reminding us that any change will require uh, states, civil society organization, but also will, will be crucial to have the organizing and mobilizing that you were referring to. And, and this is what we need to achieve, an inclusive movement to put pressure in order to implement a global fund for social protection. Now I have the honor to uh, introduce Samuel Ovara from the African Platform for Social Protection. Samuel, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Magdalene, and uh, thank you for the previous speakers, uh, for the wonderful uh, remarks you have made. Let me share my experience from uh, the point of view of somebody who is uh, implementing social protection programs in Africa on behalf of uh, colleagues in 21 countries in Africa. So basically I want to look at uh, what is working well in the context of COVID-19, what can be improved, and three, how the Global Fund for Social Protection could be an avenue not only to mobilize resources, but provide, in my view, a global voice for sharing information, for improving practices, and also for having progressive laws and policies that, it, that impact humanity and improve equity across the globe. What are we learning uh, during COVID-19? I think COVID-19 has given us one, fun, one fundamental lesson, that we are in one global space and what happens in one side affects us all and colleagues this is the moment for us to have a fund that we can speak to in terms of resources and in terms of information sharing so the moment we have a global fund for social protection is now not even tomorrow and let me start by sharing experience from africa we have had small programs in Uganda and Zimbabwe, which are ongoing through the funding from Bread for the World Germany. And the key lesson is effective messaging from trusted sources 
can impact on the low-income communities. During COVID-19, government was giving information in the media, but not everybody was being reached the way it was assumed. And through this program, you know, civil society came together and faith actors, and they said, look, some of our people are not being reached. And they were, we were able to come up with a messaging plan that was targeting persons with disability, young people, women, older persons. And we have seen improved uh, change in practice. So I think the key lesson is uh, when you have lived in a situation of uh, marginalization, you least trust that authority. So the trust comes from players like civil society, faith actors. So that respect is very important in terms of enhancing access to appropriate information in the event of a pandemic like COVID-19. And therefore, a fund like the Global Fund will not only provide an avenue for resourcing, but also for learning and scaling up good practices across all players. The second lesson we have learned is about the using of the digital technology. Regardless of low levels of literacy across various regions in the global space, specifically in Africa, we have learned that the cash transfers, uh, if they're well designed, and the uh, case in point is in Kenya, we have seen where we are involved in terms of tracking cash transfer, especially the one that were introduced during COVID-19, is using appropriate uh, tools to deliver cash uh, through mobile phones, mobile technology. One, they are timely. Two, is you can register complaints. Three, you can track who is being left behind and you can help them raise a complaint. And therefore, digital technology can be a key player in terms of bridging the gap around gender, disability, and aging. And more so on the issue of women, the, the cash trust, especially things around access to affordable credit through digital platforms, liberates the power in decision making. Then three is the power of voicing. I work and I bring a voice of colleagues from 21 national platforms in 21 countries. We have learned that when we share experience and we put them together and we approach the regional bodies as a voice of 21 players in 21 countries, we have been listened to in the various bodies like African Union. And therefore, in my view, a global fund would strengthen our solidarity in the bargaining for improving the welfare of humanity on the globe. But also I'm alive to the fact that in Africa, we are still struggling with the issue of improving systems. So disability, aging, and gender presents a challenge around inadequate data system, inadequate policies, and inadequate legal system. I think my colleague Olivia talked about right-based social protection. For us to achieve this, we need a global voice that can uh, galvanize our collective ideas together with the NDGs. This will be a game changer. And I think together, if we design this voice and build with various players, it will be a reservoir for learning. But also is this emerging issues around climate change and social protection. Colleagues, as we talk about the global fund social protection, we must all look at the emerging issues. We must ensure that this fund also is alive to some of these challenges. Because in Africa, with the emerging climate change issues around floods and the dry spell, prolonged dry spells, the gains being made around gender, disability, aging are being lost. Because any small prolonged drought or flood is catastrophic on a low income household. And therefore we need a holistic approach, social protection, not just the uh, piecemeal pilots 
which has been common, especially in Africa. And in conclusion, in our view, as a platform that addresses the issue of social protection, a global fund is a call social solidarity and social justice. And this is our desire, this is our passion. Thank you, Senator. Magdalena, you're on mute. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel, for your presentation, for reminding us that uh, the uh, Global Fund on Social Protection would strengthen solidarity, and also for reminding us of the need to have a gender, a disability, and um, an age approach to social protection. Now I will, have, uh, I will give the floor to Roshni Nukehali from the Global Call to Action Against Poverty. Uh, Roshni, you have the floor. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Magdalena, and thank you to the organizers for this opportunity here to be today to speak uh, and share India's experience. I think I'll start by giving a little background about, uh, you know, India and also the COVID context. In India, the urban environment is a complex playground, you know, where forces of caste, class and gender intersect in the face of declining welfare role of the state and diminishing role for civic participation. Uh, and in this context, migration is constant, gentrification, informality, inequality, and discrimination are widespread. And this context has two very critical implications for the urban poor, including the homeless. One is invisibility. They lack documentation to prove that they are citizens. They lack entitlements. They don't have access to water, sanitation, education, and of course, all forms of social, other forms of social protection. In COVID, we saw this exacerbated when people did not have access to food, to, to livelihood, to rental payments. Invisibility is a big part of the context. The other context is that the urban poor are very essential for the city. Without them, the city doesn't work, but they're also not valuable. So when the city goes into a lockdown, for instance, uh, we, we, we saw migrants walking thousands of kilometers back home just because they weren't able to afford rents in the city, had no way, no support system available for them. So, Invisibility and this uh, feature of not being valuable are very important part of the context of urban poverty. In this context, the social protection status, I think, and civil society's role in that is also very important. One key feature we see is low investment by the state across the board. Our government is not putting money into social protection as even Mr. Olivier spoke earlier. The 2021 budget, which was just released, has seen reductions in social policy across the board spending. Nutrition has seen cuts. The Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which was so critical during COVID, has not been enough. The increase in that has not been enough to meet the uh, levels of rising inflation. And this is happening in the rise in, in the background of the inequality barrier we see in India, where the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. So I think the lack of investment indicates a clear lack of political will. And even when investments happen, there is poor implementation and in ensuring that these measures reach. For instance, at civil society, we know that in India, even basic things like minimum wages, pension, minimum support price for crops are all only on paper, despite what the state claims. And therefore, to push for accountability in implementation, we need independent assessments and analyses led by the civil society groups. And in that, when we want to push for accountability by civil society, the role of data and evidence is a very, very key uh, role in that. But we also expect that these data processes are bottom up. You know? For instance, one exploration in very early days that civil society groups are doing in India is a social protection score, where we're trying to map all the existing benefits and then looking at for different groups of the urban poor and then looking at targeted areas of work for each of these heterogeneous groups. So these are ways in which uh, citizen generated data can actually be useful. The other uh, issue when I speak about data is a risk of data profiling, which is very, very uh, high in the Indian context uh, because there's a lot of um, you know, uh, polarity, there's a lot of uh, politics, which is uh, quite restrictive on certain groups in, in, in the country and data offers the way to actually profile these and then uh, create even more restrictive environments for them. So we need to reduce the data risks while also ensuring there's ad adequate data for pushing for state accountability. Uh, the other role for civil society, which we see is the organizing role. Uh, not just in terms of unions, which is a traditional form that we know of informal sector workers, of urban poor, but also diverse forms of collective. 
collectors because the urban poor homeless groups are also not homogeneous and especially in a country like india with caste gender issues we need diverse forms of collectors and, and civil society can play a big role in that but again this is about building collectors people's collectors in that solidarity not just dashboards and platforms where you know things are listed numbers and names are displayed but an actual solidarity uh, politics which i think civil society has a big role to play in terms of what you know support we think would be useful from the international community and the role of global coalitions uh, like the global fund is i think finding space to see how civil society can be an alternative voice to the government at the global level because we've seen that um you know through the voluntary national review process for instance where the civil society report just recently at last year's hlpf was much in contrast to the government's report so creating spaces for that voice but not just voice also using leverage through the international community to influence decision making at the national level i think that for us is very very important and how can we create pressure mechanisms you know convert the voice that we might be able to have to discernible shifts at the at the domestic level in terms of resources i think the support in resources could be very useful in advocating of course for better policy shifts at the national level but also for improving implementation structures because we have seen that even when social protection programs exist huge bureaucratic hurdles corruption lack of human resources lack of functionaries for the last mile is what really prevents people from getting what they are entitled to so i think resources in implement improving implementation also would be very helpful finally the role of technology i think the role of technology looking at it as an enabler and not as a driver i think that's an important area of input where the global community can help us i'll speak a little bit more about technology before i close i think our experience in india especially working with very very marginalized groups of urban poor shows tells us that two important points of social uh, in terms of technology is when to use technology and where to use technology when i say when it means that technology cannot drive the process it has to come downstream where technology exists as a substitute for political will the entire process caves in and this is what our experience shows us so the moment in time in any process in any welfare process when social when technology comes in is very very critical and the other critical area is where we use technology and our experience shows again the last mile is where it's most uh, useful to improve improve access and outreach but what we are seeing now typically at least in india is that technology is being used much more as a centralizing mechanism which is ironical knowing that it is technology but that is what is happening in the country for example there's a digital health id which is being uh, proposed with absolutely no reference to data protection laws or any authority which will gather quite a lot of data in a central location it can be sold on the market of course but also the government can use that for much more stricter profiling and other sorts of discriminatory practices that are going on so this will impact the urban poor the most because without that id for instance they will not have access to government healthcare so i think using technology not as a centralizing role but actually in the last mile is very important because yes we need visibilization of the urban poor and the homeless groups but that is required to ensure social protection not for surveillance which is really where the technology is at least in this country being moved forward and technology is being claimed to ensure social protection that's what we all read but actually it ends up doing more of the uh, surveillance bit so that's i think when to use and where to use technology are very important critical uh, issues finally to conclude i think uh, all governments and especially the indian government should really have robust social protection mechanisms for different kinds of urban poor groups for workers for different kinds of vulnerabilities which are both heterogeneous and longitudinal over the course of people's lifetime i think that's very important for us to understand that also to keep social protection measures as evolving particularly in the post covid context i think that becomes very very relevant to keep it as an evolving uh, you know um, area of work and looking at civil society's role as an active as well as responsive partner in ensuring social protection for the you know the ones the groups who are uh, the leave no one behind principle and data for mapping social protection needs but also a lot of monitoring to ensure that this has a people centered role as well as respecting privacy concerns and finally looking at technology to see the diversity in the needs of uh, you know urban poor groups and come downstream as an enabler so these were some of the thoughts that we've had based on our experience in india working with urban poor groups as part of organizations and civil society networks and uh, we're really excited that the global fund is uh, reaching the stage of fruition and would be very happy to see where this takes not just india but all all the countries 
Thank you very mu much, uh, Roshni, for reminding us of the importance of social protection for the European poor, but also for making the link of what the previous speaker was uh, saying. Uh, digital technology, it, it is important sometimes, but it has to be inclusive. It has to protect uh, privacy and data protection and should not be used for surveillance. In particular, when uh, in so many countries, the push is for biometric uh, uh, information. Uh, this information, like at our uh, uh, fingerprints, I Irish, uh, Irish scan or voice recognition, things that we cannot change and can provide if it's uh, not used with uh, with a good reason, it uh, it might uh, end up uh, impacting the, the data protection and the privacy of those who are living in poverty. Uh, we are moving to the final uh, speaker to from this section, and I have the pleasure to introduce to Sulustri Afrileston. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your well correctly who is from All Indonesian Trade Union Confederation. Madam, you have the floor. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mahdalena. And uh, thank you for the previous speaker with the comprehensive presentation. The COVID-19 pandemic has a broad impact on people's life, especially for the workers, both formal and informal. Many people lose their job, not, in, not enough income. Most of them do not cover by social security and no strong social protection at the country level. The tourism sector, including the hotel, guides, travel agent, is one of the sector was affected by COVID-19 pandemic. Imagine the employees of the hotel who has three children who work in the hotel must be lost his job. How do they get sick? Because they no longer pay social security contribution so that they cannot longer enjoy social security benefit. How they pay the rent of their house? How do they have to survive? What about the education for the children? Because the state does not yet have a strong and adequate social protection. And there are still many more questions. In Indonesia, Minister of State on Enterprises recorded that 2.56 million people lost their jobs and more than 1.8 million people experienced a decrease in income. The impact of the COVID-19 also goes to the trade union. KSBSC lost member more than 7,000. The COVID-19 pandemic has serve as a wake up call, alerting the international community to the crucial importance of social protection. COVID-19 has also saw the absence of the universal and comprehensive social protection system. Therefore, the countries must work together to minimize the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic toward achieving the SDGs goals and discuss effort for recovery. The countries must take steps to reduce the impact of COVID-19 pandemic quickly. As the whole world undergoes an economic recession, the government should fund economic stimulus package that are in court on promoting decent work. Micro, small and medium enterprises that provide a job for many, the working poor should be subsidized to sustain business operation and retain employment of their workers, while workers should receive income generated. Workplace should implement COVID-19 prevention and control measure with working safety com communities that are composed by management and also representative of the union that work together to address the pandemic. Direct or indirect COVID has influenced the achievement of ADCs. Therefore, all the stakeholders, the academy, media, business group, non-governmental organization, trade union, and civil society must sit together with the government at the international, regional, and also national level to discuss what steps should be taken so that the SDGs goal are achieved and no one left behind. The government cannot solve this problem alone, so the social dialogue and other form of the inclusive dialogue 
between multi-stakeholder and the government as a means of implementing SDGs is one of the key to success in reducing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and achieving the SDGs goals. I believe that a strong social protection will be reducing the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, encourage the achievement of the SDGs goal and ensure an inclusive and sustainable recovery for all. For that, UN and agencies must help poor countries to strengthen social protection at the country level through facilitate and creation of the Global Fund for Social Protection. The creation of Global Fund for Social Protection should involve and fully engage the three group of actors, the government, economic actors, and representative demand relevant civil society. It is not only a general rule. It is the best guarantee to really reach and cover all vulnerable group in society. We don't want a top-down fund where all the decision made at the international level. Since the fund should strengthening national system, the national organization have to be effectively involved in the priority setting and the management and also in the monitoring. Therefore, it is important to include the trade union and civil society organization at the national level and also in the level of the international architecture. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sulistri, and also for reminding us that we don't want a top-down uh, social protection and all the actors that social protection fund and uh, all the actors that will need to be involved. I'm going to go, I'm going to thank you, the panelists, and I'm going to directly to the next section as we are running just on time. So uh, in this section, we're going to talk about collaboration between civil society and the United Nations. I have the pleasure to give, to give the floor to Nicola Wiebe, uh, Social Protection Policy Specialist from Bread of, uh, for the World, uh, also member from the Global Coalition for Social Protection. So, Nicola, you have the floor. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you very much for the opportunity to contribute to this discussion on behalf of the Global Coalition for Social Protection Floors, a global network of civil society organizations, trade unions and think tanks committed to the realization of ILO Recommendation 202 on social protection floors. Raising social protection floors means to guarantee minimum income security over the life costs and access to essential health care. Building roofs means providing access to a home that offers safety, autonomy and opportunity. In principle, national governments bear the overall responsibility to respect, protect and fulfill these very basic human rights. At the same time, there are important tasks for civil society and for the international community of nations. The social catastrophe caused by the pandemic makes accelerated joint action ever more urgent in view of the commitments to end poverty by 2030. We just heard from social protection experts from different countries about the enormous challenges around building truly inclusive social protection floors, especially if we are serious about reaching those left furthest behind. Even universal programs like non-contributory social pensions or universal child grants often need various years and very active engagement to extend coverage to those who suffer from multiple exclusion or intersecting discrimination as for example people enduring homelessness. We have also heard about the ongoing work. Civil society organizations raise awareness for apparently invisible groups, as explained by Roshni. They provide governments with insights regarding how to overcome access hurdles, as Samuel exposed. They reconnect most vulnerable groups via inclusive digital technology to social services and protection as presented by WAP. And they are long-term long important actors to build solidarity-based social protection systems, as the history said. The corona crisis experience points again, points again at the importance of this long-term system building based on a broad social dialogue and coordination of all involved actors. 
Despite the impressive number and scale of social protection responses to the crisis, most programs have failed to protect all people in need, especially those formerly not integrated in the, into the social protection system as informal workers, undocumented migrants, homeless people, or people without access to digital technology to make their claims or to receive mobile money. Without rights-based social protection floors, social protection systems cannot protect the individual, nor use their potential to mitigate the social and economic impact of a crisis on societies as a whole. Without solid floors, the vision of adaptive social protection systems able to react to this and to future crises adequately will not materialize. Reliable system building needs long-term joint engagement and funding. Recognizing that financing social protection is primarily the responsibility of national governments, it is still evident that in some low-income countries, international support is required until international tax justice improves and domestic fiscal capacity increases. While the financing gap for low-income countries, according to recent ILO estimates, represents about 15.9% of their GDP, related to the global GDP, it is only 0.25%. But astonishingly, international funding for social protection is still extremely low, despite a vast scientific evidence of the effectiveness of investing in social protection to tackle extreme poverty. The proposal to pool funds and expertise globally for high priority issues is far from new. Many times it has been the instrument of choice to engage for common goals, as for example in education, climate, as well as related to the cross-sectoral agenda 2030. A global fund for social protection should be endowed with financial and technical resources according to the capacities and dispersed according to social needs of countries. Decisions regarding design and implementation have to be taken by the government of the recipient country based on ongoing long-term national dialogues. The United Nations and its specialized agencies are needed to play the leading role in setting up and in governing a global fund for social protection now. We in civil society are ready to support these efforts with our work on national and on international level. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicola. Um, I now give the floor to Shara Rasavi, the Director of Social, social Security of the International Labour Organization. Shara, you have the floor. Greetings and thank you very much, uh, Magdalena. Uh, and many thanks to the organizers and sponsors of this event uh, for the invitation. It is indeed a, a real honor and pleasure for me to be sharing the panel with such uh, distinguished speakers uh, whom we have heard uh, so far. Uh, so let me allow me just to sort of begin by saying just in the same way that this COVID-19 crisis has really uh, been the great revealer of gaps and inequalities and gaps in coverage and comprehensiveness uh, of social protection systems, it has also at least played a useful role in underscoring, I think, the urgency of mobilizing resources to invest more effectively in social protection systems, including social protection floors, uh, across the world in a way that they can guarantee at least a basic level of income security and access to health care uh, for everyone. Now, to create the kind of preconditions that we need for an inclusive recovery from the present crisis and also sustain socioeconomic development in the context of the many other crises, not least climate related, that we're likely to face, countries really need to make a shift from the kind of ad hoc temporary schemes and if I may say so, very porous safety nets that have been in place to really building solid social protection systems, including very solid foundations uh, provided by social protection floors. Now, to make this kind of leap forward demands a range of capacities, not least, you know, we heard colleagues talk about the importance of political and administrative capacities but also very importantly, financial capacities. And already taking into account the impact of the COVID-19 crisis, our latest uh, ILO estimates, which uh, were just cited by Nicola, show that for low-income countries, what they need to invest is an additional 
77.9 billion US dollars, which is close to about 16% of their GDP uh, to achieve the kind of uh, financing, to close the kind of financing gap that is needed to achieve the SDGs 1.3 and 3.8. Uh, now this is this is clearly a huge a huge ask. Now current expenditure levels are clearly not uh, up to scratch when we look at the gaps that exist, and they're clearly insufficient to close the kind of persistent gaps that we see in coverage. Um, and obviously, uh, the kind of uh, stimulus measures that we have seen across the world uh, be put in place. Uh, I think in that context, we've seen again, low income countries not being able to match the kind of stimulus measures that high income countries have been able to put in place uh, to reduce the negative uh, repercussions of the COVID-19 crisis. And I think this, what ILO calls a stimulus gap uh, between uh, high income and low income countries is really uh, another, another very significant indication of the differences and inequalities that exist in the world in terms of fiscal capacities. Um, and I think it's even more important and more concerning as we know that the cumulative effects of fiscal policy are likely to become even larger as we move on into the, into the medium and longer term. Now, in this context, if I may, I just want to highlight five key points. First, developing countries, we know we don't, we don't have the luxury of being able to mount the kind of deficit spending that uh, high income countries have been doing. But nevertheless, for even those developing countries that do not have balance of payments constraints or high debt issues, they're still not spending sufficiently to address the crisis because they fear the pressure of credit rating agencies and the pressure of coming from financial markets. Uh, in other words, I think for both ideological and structural reasons, many developing countries are not doing what is necessary to, to counter the vicious spiral of economic contraction that has been unleashed by the crisis. Secondly, all developing countries can put more effort into mobilizing additional resources through progressive forms of taxation, including wealth and inheritance taxes, for example, not only to be able to invest in social protection systems, but also to address the rising tide of inequality, which has continued unabated during this very pandemic. We've seen the figures released by Bloomberg that show how inequalities have been increasing through this pandemic. Uh, and the wealth has been trickling up continuously. Thirdly, while domestic resource mobilization must remain the cornerstone of national social protection systems, and I think we can all agree on that, uh, for developing countries, international coordination is absolutely critical, especially in the current context when we have falling commodity prices, disruptions in export revenues, and also dwindling remittances. And here, I think it's not a question of saying one thing or the other. There are a range of measures that need to be taken simultaneously. For example, for, for countries that are saddled with huge external debts, it's absolutely critical to find workable solutions for internationally agreed debt restructuring so that uh, they are not forced to service their debt and when they can be using those resources to invest in public health and income support measures that are so desperately needed. Uh, equally, there's a dire need for greater international cooperation on tax matters that other panelists have been referring to, not only with regard to tax havens, which are very important to be addressed and closed, but also when it comes to taxing multinational corporations, which are currently basically managing to avoid taxation through profit shifting. Uh, so we need to have, for example, a unitary taxation system whereby each country is able to tax the global profits of the multinational corporation based on their share of sales and employment. Likewise, it's absolutely critical to turn the tide of these illicit financial flows, which again requires global cooperation and without which domestic resource mobilization cannot happen uh, when you have you know, finances leaving countries. And last but not least, international cooperation can also take the form of creating a global fund with the explicit purpose of supporting developing countries in mobilizing and, and being able to mobilize also their own resources to build national social protection floors. And as we know, this is an idea that has, was first floated by two of the special rapporteurs that are in this uh, event. Uh, and, and it has had a lot of traction, particularly in, in over the past year in the context of the COVID crisis. Uh, 
So let me now just have two, two quick points to wrap up with. Fourthly, I think, following from the point uh, that was just made, civil society organizations make a critical contribution in this respect in terms of moving all of these ideas forward for greater global co uh, co collaboration and solidarity. And I would like to highlight in particular the particular role that uh, uh, more than 100 organizations that form the Global Coalition for Social Protection Floors have been playing uh, and had a significant impact in advocating for universal social protection. From the very beginning, the Global Coalition has been a strong supporter of the UN Social Protection Floor Initiative and the ILO Social Protection Floor's recommendation. And today, uh, as we see, they're advocating very strongly for the Global Fund for Social Protection. The Global Coalition, I think, plays a really important role here in knowledge development and advocacy, but also a very important partner in implementation. For instance, in the work that uh, we're currently doing in the context of the EC uh, collaboration uh, on public finance and social protection, where we're working very closely together with the Global Coalition uh, and UNICEF uh, to make this to take this project forward. And finally, I think it's really important to emphasize that at the national level, we really need inclusive social dialogues. And I think the previous speakers, all of them coming from civil society, have spoken very meaningfully to this issue about the essential role of these voices to be able to have a broad consensus to inform the formulation, the implementation, the financing, and the monitoring of social protection policies so that there's adequate accountability and feedback. Now, together, I think with workers and employers organizations, civil society actors can really play a really important uh, role in giving voice to those who would otherwise not be heard and to push for greater accountability on the part of those who make decisions and who are supposed to be implementing uh, social protection policies and asking for greater transparency of policy processes. So to conclude, I think in a, in, a, in a very globalized world that we are living in, the issue of financing social protection cannot be left to national governments alone. Solidarity, cooperation and coordination at the global level are indispensable to really be able to find a workable solution. And in this context, both civil society and organizations and UN organizations have a critical role to play, with civil society providing the vision and the passion and specific solutions to make the enjoyment of human rights a reality for everyone, and UN agencies doing their part by providing the kind of policy analysis and technical uh, options that are needed for implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, much uh, Shara. Um, I, I thank you the, the presentation of Nicola and Shara, a very powerful presentation on the topic. And now to conclude, uh, this uh, important panel, I'm going to give the floor to the director of the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development and risk. Paul, you have the floor. Thank you, Magdalena. Um, uh, hello, everyone, and greetings from uh, Geneva. Uh, my job at the end was to try to sum up uh, some main points and reflect on the way forward. Um, everyone has been so clear and, and passionate. In some ways, that's a, a quite an easy thing to do, but at the risk of not adding uh, very much uh, value. I, I think I'd like to just reflect on, on, on six points. And, and the first is uh, inescapably COVID-19. I think many panelists uh, have recognized that, uh, as Maryam did, that this will roll back progress on social development. This will roll back progress on human rights. We risk social uh, regression and in particular for some groups more than others for people living in countries with fewer resources with less capacity for women all over the world and for people who uh, may have already been vulnerable due to characteristics such as disability uh, age ethnicity race their migrant status so this is a huge huge tragedy uh, and setback and the numbers are huge but behind each and every one of those numbers is is a real person and we just have to reflect on the scale of the challenge uh, that we're facing. Secondly, on, on social protection within that context, of course, COVID-19 has placed uh, social protection right at the center. Social protection systems have been ramped up uh, in many countries. I think um, high income countries have had more capacity uh, to do that. And I would also say that uh, the countries that already had 
a comprehensive understanding and approach to social protection systems, we're in a better starting place and we're able to put in measures much more effectively and much more, uh, much more quickly. Uh, but even in countries with uh, uh, conservative administrations, with right-wing administrations, we've seen a, a lot of uh, ideological shifting on social protection. We've seen a lot more expenditures in, in all high-income countries, regardless of their politics. And therefore, as much as COVID-19 is uh, a tragedy, uh, it won't be the last crisis or shock that we'll face even in the next decade, I'm sure. And so it does represent a, a very clear and real political opportunity uh, to promote the cause of uh, social uh, protection. So uh, we have to move quickly, I believe, as a, as a movement, as a progressive force, and we have to strike while the iron uh, is hot. Um, third, on, on the Global Fund, uh, I think it is very, very helpful to uh, look at this in some depth. And I think it was particularly helpful for Olivier to address some of the misunderstandings or misconceptions of how a fund uh, might work. Because let's face it, and as uh, Solistri pointed out, global funds have uh, not always had a good reputation. They've had a mixed reputation, particularly when they have uh, failed to move beyond donorship, where they failed to uh, act from a position of real ownership, where they've not been built from the bottom up respecting country systems, when they've not aligned with human rights, where they've not incorporated civil society and local groups in their design and implementation. So we have to recognize that there is quite a lot of uh, suspicion beyond the politics of, of, of global funds. And so it is helpful to point out that ultimately, you know, countries have to be in the driving seat in terms of both designing with their national stakeholders, but also paying for and raising the domestic resources to pay for uh, social protection uh, systems and flaws. Um, I think the second thing is social protection uh, is, is a, an effective investment across the board uh, in terms of being able to uh, defend and meet many of the SDGs. And that's going to be important as, a, as an advocacy point when ODA is likely to go down in the next few years as countries uh, revert to domestic priorities in the aftermath of um, COVID. And that's why, as several uh, participants have pointed out, it's important to look at the implementation of social protection systems paid for domestically, supplemented potentially by a global fund, but within the full context of fiscal policy and the distributional effects of fiscal policy, both globally and nationally, including looking at tax avoidance, uh, tax evasion, uh, augmenting domestic resources with debt relief and, and, and many other channels. Um, I think the fourth point I wanted to talk about was, um, you know, the financing uh, of social protection is one side of it, but as Roshni pointed out, uh, it's not, financing isn't the only constraint. There is political will, there is administrative um, capacity, and I think there is a role for the research community, of which uh, UNRIS sits as a part of, uh, to quickly ramp up the evidence on the effectiveness of social protection systems, to have the data at hand that can be used in fora such as the G20, but also, uh, also beyond, to defend the advocacy and to convince those who are yet to be convinced that social protection is an extremely, uh, an extremely important part of their uh, armory for dealing not just with COVID-19, uh, uh, but also the shocks that will come in the future. Um, the, the fifth point I wanted to make, and I, I hope this draws uh, very much on the presentations around uh, homelessness, is that social protection systems have to be uh, comprehensive, universal, holistic, and sort of multi-sector, and, and, and not just temporary, they have to be adaptive, as a couple of uh, participants also pointed out. And therefore, you know, they, they can't just be a, uh, a temporary measure that can be then withdrawn once the world feels that it's not uh, under, under pressure anymore. Uh, I'm originally from the UK, and uh, I must say that considerable efforts were made at the beginning of the pandemic to uh, provide, to get people off the streets at the very least. And I think that was a, um, a, an unusual 
uh, intervention, but a very welcome one in the UK. But the risk is in a few months time when we're, uh, you know, beyond the immediate uh, fears of the pandemic, that things will revert to normal, which means that we have to be putting in place uh, social protection systems, which are, as I said, comprehensive, which are universal, but which are not temporary, which can support and accompany people throughout their whole life course when they need support and when they don't, because people don't fall into these two camps uh, for their whole lives and people move in and out of employment. They move in and out of circumstances where social protection systems become an important uh, uh, part of the resilience infrastructure uh, for them. And then lastly, the sixth point on, on digital technology. Uh, in, in two ways, technology, we talk about it as, as being double-edged. It does present huge opportunities, including within the context of social protection. It does have the potential if designed in the right way with the right groups, with the right transparency to get support to people more quickly, uh, more efficiently and with less risk of interference and leakage. But at the same time, the systems have to respect other human rights, particularly around uh, privacy, location. And that is a, a considerable risk that's probably grown in the context of this COVID-19 pandemic. So tech is an opportunity. But in, in a way, you have to shine a lot of sunlight on it to make sure that tech within the context of social protection won't be another way of abusing a vital system of support for people um, around the world. So those are my six points. I hope they uh, added value in some way. Thank you very much, Paul, for uh, that wonderful sum up of the discussion. Um, we are just on time to finalize. I have to tell everyone that uh, the organizers have collected the question and answers that have been put in the chat and uh, they're going to be responded and then circulated to the participants. Finally, I just would like to thank uh, you all. I think that as uh, Paul mentioned, uh, there is a moment now with COVID uh, there is, this is the time, the right time for the Global Fund for Social Protection, uh, in which all progressive forces from government, civil society organizations, academic, trade union, we have to push it forward. Um, and, and I think that this, this meeting has, has really uh, shown that uh, there is momentum and we have achieved uh, quite a lot. Uh, and it is time to keep uh, pushing for his uh, realization. I would like to thank you all. Thank you very much for uh, your participation in the meeting. And um, let's keep fighting for the next Global Fund for uh, Social Protection. Thank you all. Goodbye.